Hey Journey, welcome to our online experience. We are so glad that you guys have joined us and really stuck with us through this summer, through this spring. It's been crazy, we know, but we just wanna say thank you for tuning in every single week and being with us and sticking with Journey through all of this. We know that uh, this has been a weird summer and I wanna encourage you to seek growth I want this week. I want you to find ways that you can enhance your, your, your faith or grow your faith through all of this. And one of the best ways to do that, I believe, is through joining a small group. When you're a part of a small group, you are part of a group of other believers, people who are, you know, looking for ways to grow their faith as well and a place to ask questions and to just be yourself. And so we want you to check out our website, journeymain.com, and you can find out just how to join a small group there. Just like a garden needs water and it needs you know, nutrients to grow, we all need some of that in our lives to grow. And the best place that we think that can happen is within a small group. So would you look into joining one today? Maybe check out our website, read the information, and then let us know. We'd love to hook you up with an in-person group or with an uh, online digital group as well. Hopefully you guys are having a great week and enjoying this series. Um, it's been impactful for me. I know um, becoming a Christian sometimes is, is really just the easiest part. It's walking it out after that and figuring out what does it mean to be a Christian, to follow Jesus is where it really the rubber meets the road. So hopefully you guys are enjoying this. Uh, we'll see you next time. Here's Jim. Hey, if this is your first time joining us, my name is Jim. I'm the lead pastor here at Journey. The idea that we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks is that personal matters matter more. Now, you already knew that, I'm sure. When something is personal to us, it just matters more. And this is true in every area of life. Personal matters get our attention, our focus, our thoughts center around them. They garner our affection. The things that we adore or we admire in life we kind of center around our personal things. And what's interesting is the more personal something gets, the more it matters to us. Uh, research backs this up as well. Neuroscientists in the middle of the 1900s discovered something they called the reticular activating system. You, you may have heard of it before. It's RAS for short. Essentially, what the reticular activating system is, it's a part of our brain that filters the thousands upon thousands of bits of information that we get every single hour. And it decides what do we need to pay attention to and what do we need to ignore. If your brains had to absorb and digest everything that we saw, all the data that we were receiving all the time, it would wear out. We, we would not have the energy to survive. So the RAS actually filters through these things to figure out what do I need to let through or what do I need to ignore? And the RAS, it asks the question, does it matter to me? Here's an example of, of how it works. You show up to the car dealership and you're looking at, uh, you know, on the lot and you see this beautiful black pickup truck and you're thinking to yourself, that is the most beautiful black pickup I've ever seen in my life. And you shell out the money for it. You buy the black pickup. You drive it off the lot. And what do you see a hundred times over the next seven days? You see black pickup trucks everywhere. They're all over the road. And you're thinking, did everybody go out and buy a, buy a black pickup truck this past weekend? No, no, they didn't. You just, you know, you, you suddenly see all the black trucks. Why? Because it became personal to you. That's what the RAS does. It asks the question, does it matter to me? And if so, we're in. And if not, we kind of check out. We literally go to sleep. That part of our brain that, that controls that function of consciousness and, and, uh, and sleep. So when the RES kicks in, it's filtering something. We literally go to sleep. Uh, uh, this is why when you're standing there in a conversation and someone talking to you for like three or four minutes and you're kind of like, oh, I'm sorry, I checked out for a little bit. I kind of zoned out. You know, the, the whole time you're standing there going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But then after three or four minutes, you realize, I have not heard a single word that you've said to me. Husbands, I feel like we especially need to pay attention to this, right? It's like, hey, Tan, I think I got it, but could you just start over again from the beginning because I wasn't listening to a thing you said. Personal matters matter more. You know who gets this idea and who leverages uh, this idea billions for billions and billions of dollars? Amazon, Google, Facebook. They're not just throwing out random products and hoping you'll buy one. No, they have a very specific and direct marketing strategy, and they want to make things as personal as possible to us. 
My wife, Tanya, and I, we're convinced that Alexa is listening to us in our kitchen. I, I don't know if anyone else has experienced this before, but, you know, you're, we're sitting in there having a conversation in the kitchen about something, and then, you know, we'll walk over to our phone or our laptop, our tablet, we'll, we'll pick it up, and as soon as we open it up, there's an advertisement for the very thing we had just been talking about a few minutes before. It's a little scary, isn't it? I, in research for this, I came across an ebook uh, online that was titled Personalize or Perish. And it was directed for anybody that's doing anything in the digital market, any kind of digital retail or social media. And basically the point of the book is just its title. It, it, that it's, it's just, hey, it, you better get personal with your content or, or you're not going to survive. Either get personal or perish. It's got to be personal or else it's going to perish. It's going to die. It's going to fade away. And the reason why we're talking about this idea over the next few weeks is because I think the same thing is true of our faith. We have to personalize our faith or it will perish. This has been something that, that I've been thinking about over the last few months. And as I listen to people's stories, uh, you know, about why they walked away from church or, you know, when faith didn't really make a big impact in their life, there can be a number of different reasons as to why. But one of the most common ones that I keep seeing over and over of why people kind of walk away or why they miss out on, on what they could experience in church and in faith and in their relationship with God is because of lack of personal experience when it comes to faith. And if you're not a Christian, this may be the reason you kind of walked away. Th that when you were raised in church, you had parents taking you to church or grandparents taking you to church. And so you were there and you believed as best you could and you participated as much as, as you knew how. But for some reason, it just didn't stick. It was never personal for you. You know, yeah, I believe in God. I'm just wrestling with, with whether or not he cares about my world. If it's, if it's not personal, then faith begins to fizzle and we ultimately miss out on what God has for us to experience. And personally for me, the things that have grown my faith the most are the personal things that God has done in my life. And I'm not gonna bore you with the details of, of those because the reality is I could share them and you would kind of just shrug your shoulders and go, hey, but, well, <laughs> Jim, what's the big deal with that? The reality is what's personal for me may not be personal for you. And in the same way, what's personal for you may not be what's personal for the, the person sitting at home next to you or your neighbor, or your friend. But I'm becoming more and more convinced that if we don't personalize our faith, it will perish. In fact, this is what we do here at Journey. It's the way we help people connect their faith to life. It's the reason why we say we hope this place feels like home. There's nothing more personal than home. We gotta personalize our faith or it will perish. Now, the good news is, as we look at the life of Jesus, he came to be a person on this earth and when he interacted with people, he got very personal with them. And he talked about this, the, you know, the universal love of God, the fact that God so loved the world. But, but then when he interacted with people, he spent his time healing them and conversing with them in some very personal ways. And then he described the relationship that people could have with him as we follow him and we put our faith in him. And when Jesus described that relationship, he described something that was very personal. One instance of this is in John chapter 10. But to understand what's happening in John chapter 10, we've got to rewind a little bit and go back to John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, Jesus met a young blind man. And he, was, he had given this young man back his sight, which you know, is completely incredible, but there was only one problem. He did it on the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, they were, of course, very upset with him. This, they, they couldn't understand why would Jesus heal somebody on the Sabbath. So the Pharisees launch an investigation. They meet the eyewitnesses. They meet with the kid who was healed. They meet with the kid's parents. And they ask, he asks them all sorts of questions. They eventually end up approaching Jesus and confronting him on this. And Jesus doesn't let them off the hook lightly. He battles with them a little bit and he ends up calling them blind. And they're like, wait a second, you're calling me blind? And as the Pharisees kind of begin to buck up a little bit, Jesus is like, look, 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 I'm not really calling you blind. I'm just saying that you don't see the right way. You don't see me the right way. And it's in the middle of this kind of back and forth, in the middle of this argument, that Jesus says this. He says, very truly, I tell you Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, to which the Pharisees would have been like, do what? We were just talking about this blind kid that you healed and you know, doing this thing on the Sabbath that was absolutely horrible, horrible. Like, and now you're talking about a sheep pen? But Jesus was teaching them about their blindness, about how they're gonna miss the point. He's going to begin to explain the right way of seeing Jesus and what he came to do. And in doing so, he shows us what a relationship with him is all about. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The translation for us is, if you remember back in high school when you were sneaking into, into your house 
to your bedroom window in the middle of the night, you were up to no good. And that's really all Jesus is saying here. He's, he's basically talking in the sheep shepherd language that the Pharisees and the people of this time would understand, although we might not. He continues, he says, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. There was this personal intimacy that a shepherd would have with their sheep. All of the shepherds would kind of put all the sheep into one pen and then the shepherd knew each one of his sheep by name. When he's brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, the text tells us, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. The Pharisees just weren't getting it. They were being a little dense, a little thick. And the problem was is that Jesus was talking the third person. So he ends up getting really, really clear and he transitions to the first person. And I'm so glad he did because as he does, he makes it really, really clear for us what a relationship with him would look like. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Oftentimes when the shepherd would put the sheep up for the night in the pen, whether in a, uh, in a pen or, or a cave, they would kind of lay down in front of the entrance to the pen or the cave in order to protect the sheep. <clears throat> so throughout the night, the, the shepherd lied, laid there and kind of laid down his life for his sheep in order to make sure that they didn't get out of the cave or to make sure that nothing else got in to hurt them. So that's what Jesus is describing here. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Come in, coming in, they will find protection in me. Going out, they will find provision in me. But the thief, the, the thief, the thief which he had talked about earlier, the one who, who jumps into the pen through some other way, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's saying, look, look, the, the thief is something different. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's not me. I'm not a thief. I have come, he says. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I'm not the thief. I'm not here to do evil. The reason I came is to give them life. The people who would put their faith in me, the people who would follow me as their shepherd, I came to give them life, to, to give them a full life. And full here means like overflowing, not just to the top, but actually overflowing. Jesus is saying, look, look at the blanket that was just healed. Can you imagine the kind of life that he's experiencing now, seeing for the very first time? In the same way, I came to bring life to all who would follow me. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then Jesus kind of transitions for just, just a few verses. He talks about the antithesis of the good shepherd. He talks about the idea of this, this hired hand. He says the hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees a wolf coming, he abandons the sheep. He runs away. And then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. Now, I love that Jesus included this in, in his illustration because I believe that it is the battle for us. Regardless of where you are with your faith, when you get in a circumstance that, that it's not kind of going our way, it's weighing down on us, it's making us feel like we can't go on, we don't know how much longer we can take it, we say all sorts of, of, of things that kind of come to our mind. And it may not be a physical wolf, but it's a wolf nonetheless, right? It's a financial issue, it's a health issue, it's a job issue, it's a family issue or a relational issue. And in those moments, we can think to ourselves, God, where are you? Have you left us on our own? Have you run off? Or are you here in the midst of this? And Jesus in this passage of scripture, he's saying, look, I'm not some hired hand. I care for you personally. You might be in this moment where you're questioning God. Do you really care for me? And in that moment, I want you to remember, don't ever forget this. I'm not a hired hand. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep just as my sheep know me just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And now Jesus is connecting this relationship, right? The intimacy and the closeness that Jesus experiences with God the Father. He's, he's saying, look, you can experience the very same thing with me. In the same way that the Father knows me, I know the Father, and you can know me, and I can know you. And then he says, and I, I lay down my life for the sheep. Little did they know that not too long after this, Jesus would go to the cross and lay down his life for them and die for the sins of the whole world. Little did they know that death would punctuate the kind of shepherd that Jesus is. And Jesus saying, look, the relationship I have with those that follow me, it's personal. And I didn't just come to save the world. I, I, I came to save your world. He knows your name. He cares for you like a shepherd. 
And again, it's not magic. It's not that, that everything just kind of works out and everything goes great. But, but as we follow him, he shapes our thoughts. He shapes our, our, our perspective, our decisions, our affections, the, the, the things that we care about. And as a result, we live a changed life. He says, I came to walk with you. I came to lead you in the same way that a shepherd would lead the sheep. Guys, it's personal. And throughout scripture, God calls us his children, his sons and his daughters. It, I mean, it doesn't get any more personal than that, does it? So Jesus in John 10 is saying, look, it's personal. And in order for us to experience the personal nature of this relationship, that we need to get a little sheepish. N not, not fearful or shy like culture kind of assumes. Sheep is like res resembling a sheep. I think Jesus was, would say, that's right. Resemble a sheep in your relationship with me. Follow me in, in an intimate way, in a relational way. In, in, you know, I, I know you when you know me kind of a way, in, in a personal way, because I am a personal savior. Now that begs the question, how do we follow him? In his classic book, The Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster outlines 12 disciplines that help us follow Jesus. You may hear that word discipline and kind of shriek back and think, I don't like that word. I'm not really a disciplined person. The reality is we're all disciplined. We're just disciplined about things we care about and we let our discipline slide on the things we don't care about. So Richard Foster spells out 12 different disciplines. And I'm just gonna give you a, a few here, to, just a, a few to take away. And these things, again, they will help make this relationship more personal. The first is this, study. He talks about the discipline of study regarding the scripture, and not even just the scriptures, but other books written from a Christian perspective of how to live your life, how to follow Jesus in your life, in your marriage, in your relationships, in your dating relationships, at work. You need to find something to study. Next is prayer. We're gonna dive into this like head first next week, so I'm not gonna jump into that. Don't miss next week. Serving is another one. When you say, God, here's what I have. I, it may not be much, but, but, but take this and, and use it in some way. And God takes what you offer to him and he uses it to impact someone else's life. Even though what he does in their life may not be personal to you, it makes your faith grow so much more in those moments. The next is guidance. Guidance is simply finding some people to speak life and give you guidance. This is why we encourage people to be in groups. You should be surrounded by people that have the opportunity to encourage you and speak life into you and build you up. And the last one, again, there's 12. There's so many more. Here's just a few. The last one is celebration. Look for ways to be thankful in your life. Look for things that God has done in your life that have made a positive impact and give thanks to him for it. Again, it's another way to get personal. Now, now this is not earning God's love. Oftentimes we can treat these things like this is, you know, God, if I did A, then that means you have to go do B. But I love how Richard Foster puts it. He says, the disciplines don't earn God's grace. The disciplines simply position us before God so that we can experience his grace and so that he can transform us and so that it can get personal for us. A great example of this is in your marriage. In marriage, you sign a marriage certificate and you're legally married. But if you never talk, if you never interact, if you never date, that there's not really gonna be a relationship. Instead, you dialogue daily and you date when you can and you build a life together. That's what builds the relationship. And this is what the disciplines do for us. They help us make it personal to build this relationship. That, that's what it does for our relationship with Jesus. These disciplines help our relationship grow and help make our relationship more personal. So here's the question I want to leave you with today. What step can you take to make it more personal? Does it begin studying a book of the Bible? Maybe pray for the first time or pray for the first time in a long time. Maybe you need to celebrate something that God has done in your life. Or maybe you need to join a small group and seek guidance from some others who are following Jesus as well. When you take a step, when you make it personal, that changes everything. When you get sheepish and you start following, it gets personal. When you get personal, it gets abundant. We begin to experience life to the full, which is exactly what our Savior came to give us. To experience life to its fullest. For our relationship to be a little bit more personal. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you. God, I thank you for this opportunity first to understand this incredible illustration that Jesus gave us, that he didn't come to, to just be this, this kind of cosmic savior, but he came to be a personal savior. God, for those of us that, that struggle with this relationship of, of knowing Jesus personally, maybe we've read the word and we've read the scriptures and we've been in groups and we've been in studies and we know the thoughts and the theology, but, but there's no real personal connection between us and our savior, between us and our heavenly father. God, I pray that this series, that today would be, begin a step in that direction. God, of how to make that relationship more personal, to not leave it up to chance, chance, 
But to, to be disciplined, to take a step and say, I'm going to study, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, I'm going to pray, I'm going to join a group, I'm going to talk about what God's doing in my life or, or maybe in my family. I'm going to celebrate. F- Father, I pray for the person that's hearing this, maybe for the first time, and says, that's what I want. I want to know him personally. God, I pray that you would give him the courage to take that step and the wisdom to know which step to take. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Journey, I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. I pray you have an amazing week. Join me back here next week for part two of this when we dive into the whole idea of prayer. One of the the most challenging things in, in kind of walking out and living your faith as a Christian. I think you'll enjoy it. It has meant so much to me and I think it's gonna mean so much to you. Have an amazing week. I'll see you.